Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Prime Talk. Today, I have a really special guest. Today, I'm having Troy Johnston. Troy is the co-founder and CEO of Seller Tools, which is an all-in-one suite uh, 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 for optimization tools uh, that focus on focuses on growth for Amazon sellers. So if you're an Amazon seller that's looking to grow, they have a suite of tools for you. He's going to touch more about that uh, very, very soon. But in the meantime, let's uh, welcome uh, Troy to the show. Troy, welcome to the show. Yeah, great. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. So today's episode is really going to be all about you, the story of Troy Johnston. So you're going to share with us, you know, who are you? Where are you from? Where were you born? Where'd you grow up? How'd you bring in uh, your prof uh, professional career and how you ended up in uh, e-commerce? So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Sounds great. Yeah. Looking forward to it. <laughs> all right, go ahead. You can start. At free, okay. Fire free will. Yeah. A little bit about me, and and honestly, I'm, I'm I'm one of those people. I guess this speaks to my my upbringing that uh, when it comes to talking about myself, I'm uh, I'm used to trying to deflect a little bit more and uh, and talk about some other things. But uh, but yeah, I mean, when it comes to starting from the beginning, I actually was uh, was born in Japan. Um, oh, I was a military wow. kid. I didn't expect yeah. that at all. Okay, military <laughs> Brad, born in Japan. Mm -hmm. what, what, your father, your mother, both. Uh... Both at that time, they were both in the military, both in the Air Force. Um, oh, wow. So I was born on base there um, and spent most of my uh, most of my uh, early younger days in Japan. Um, great experience. I mean, I have I have some Until memories. Which, which age or what age? I, I, I moved. We moved, I think, when I was about eight years old. Oh, so for your first eight years of your life, you're in Japan. Yeah. Speaking yep. Japanese at all? Uh, very, very little, very little. And like my mom, she was, uh, she was helping and teaching, uh, speak English there. So, um, taking part in some of that and getting kind of uh, engulfed more in the culture. And I wish I had better memories. I have, I have great memories, but there, there's not as many as I like for that experience. Yeah. Yeah. I wish you could archive a bit more on the mm -hmm. database, but, um, which part of Japan? It was in, um, oh man, the name is going to elude me now. Um, North, South center. What do you remember? It was in, uh, oh man. <laughs> See, this this is me, not my. Not what was the name of the Air Force Base, at least? You remember the name of the. You were living on base, I would assume, no? On, on base, on base. Um, it was yeah, a fort, this, for that. Usually it starts with, with the fort, right? Starts, yeah, starts with, well, it starts with a, a, a Y. Um, People are gonna be like, "Oh man, you should, you should." <laughs> All you right, should never mind. Let's let's keep moving. <laughs> if it comes to mind, just let us know. So, first eight years of your life, you're in Japan. Wow, that's pretty uh, pretty unique. Uh, mm -hmm. Eight years old, you guys, uh, uh, you know, you move where back to the states? Yeah, yeah. We uh, we ended up moving back uh, to uh, to the U.S. Um, and then really kind of got settled in in, in the Midwest. Um, this is which, where the which part? In uh, Derby, Kansas. Uh, we we ended up moving back to uh, in the same same trajectory there where we were moving close to. I remember McConnell Air Force Base uh, was the base there uh, in the area, so uh, we settled into to Derby, and that, that was home for a, a long time. This uh, um, so this has nothing to do with the Kentucky Derby, right? That's a whole different world. No, no, no. Yeah, this is uh, this is a Derby as a the city. Uh, the Kentucky Derby is the yeah, the race the one that takes place in in Kentucky. In Kentucky. Um, right. But yeah, yeah. It's uh, if you're familiar with like Wichita, Derby's kind of like a satellite of of uh, that area, and you know it's still pretty rural uh, being out in Kansas. Um, but that's Is that really where you went to a junior high, high school, graduated. Yep. Yeah, you got it. We I, really from moving from there, it was you know really starting school, and really all the way through to uh, to high school. Um, that was that was home for us. Um, and then, got it. what was the next station for you after high school? Then after high school, we we decided to move to Florida. Um, Were you meaning the whole family or just yourself? No, <clears throat> excuse me. It was um, it was the whole family. So it was kind of around the time where I was thinking about you know uh, thinking about college, where to attend school. Uh, my parents at the time were thinking about being closer to family, and then you know as they're they're getting uh, older, of, of sort of settling in and creating roots somewhere else. So, um, so yeah, oh, you know, I can I can I cannot avoid the cliche. If you're about to retire. Florida is a destination, right? Uh, yeah, it's like a magnet for, for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. But it's not, it's not bad. I tell you, I mean, I, I enjoyed the Midwest, but there's, there's, you know, 
it, it's nice to never have to warm up your car and scrape your windows and, and do all of that stuff. So, you know, okay, and which part of uh, Orlando did you guys settle in? So we actually ended up on uh, the coast. We, we uh, settled I said in Orlando. Melbourne. I meant Florida. Yeah. Uh, well, Florida, um, which I'm now kind of in the Orlando area, but at the time of that move, we, uh, we settled in uh, Melbourne, uh, Florida, which coast. Is it spelled the same way as Melbourne, Australia? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Is this like a twin city or something or some sort of a satellite? No, well, no. I mean like a satellite of, um, of uh, Melbourne or something. Cause you know, I know I live in New Jersey and I know New Jersey is based on the original Jersey Island, uh, you know, in the UK, United Kingdom, much like New York, there's New York. So I'm just wondering if there's any uh, resemblance to either uh, Melbourne and Australia, maybe also it comes from the UK where kind of the, uh, you know, uh, the British empire is sprawled around the world and you got new this or just copy the name straight up. You know, there's London, Kentucky somewhere. Yeah, I'm sure there is. And the original London is in London, uh, UK. Never mind. So uh, city, <laughs> city names and uh, affiliations is the second round that we have. We have the Derby in Kentucky or Derby in Kansas. <laughs> and now we're doing Melbourne, Australia and Melbourne, Florida. <laughs> some sort of uh, some sort of uh, wacky um, uh, city type of names. Yeah, you, uh, you seem yourself to be uh, attached to, but uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, that was, that was the next step. And, um, I ended up waiting, a waiting a year to get, uh, that time being sensitive to like in-state tuition and thinking about college and that type of thing. And, um, so went to, started going to school, started attending college, uh, locally community college, and then moved on from that to, uh, attending the university of Florida. Um, so moved out to Gainesville for, uh, for school, uh, which was great, you know, great college, uh, was working through, um, working through school, uh, but what'd you learn in school? What'd you, what'd you major in school? So I went into the College of Journalism and Communication uh, with a real big emphasis on advertising. That was really what my, I always knew I wanted to get into, into advertising, um, which was always really unique, how they structured schools and programs where like advertising, especially at the University of Florida, where advertising was in jour journalism and communications, then marketing had this very heavy business uh, finance sort of bent. Um, and I always just thought there was, there was a far more overlap in the two areas. So really interesting now, you know, kind of the school, the programs, uh, the colleges, uh, as I like to, to call them kind of the, the segmented, um, different, uh, you know, study paths. Um, it's really interesting. So, so you found that to be a cross synergy between the marketing of and journalism, but also marketing and the business world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, they, they sort of separated that out. And I, I, I thought, you know, when, when going to school that, you know, there would be, you know, there, there would be a lot more, um, overlap. Synergy, yeah. It's, it's all, it's all bundled up. But when you go out to the business world, you kind of see it. One serves the other. You, if you're a big business, big, big corporation, even in finance, you use, you know, journalists or whatever it is to, to market yourself, uh, vice versa. Um, uh, the, the journalists uh, are using uh, the big businesses to, you know, get what they need. It can be a software solution and stuff like that. There's a lot of cross synergies in many, many levels. Uh, but in any case, all right, so you graduated which year? Let's, let's uh, touch this uh, been, on that. Yeah, this would have been uh, 09 uh, graduated. 2009, you graduated, fresh out of college. So what's the next station for you? Yeah, this is where there's, a, I think for, for most, I had a lot of uncertainty, you know, it, going down that path and being used to working. I was working two jobs in school, put, my, put myself through college. And what kind of jobs? Just as a side note, what kind of jobs? Random jobs? Uh... So I, I was working at, I was actually working at Best Buy. Um, and I worked for Best Buy for like nine years. That was always a steady, and I was serving a bunch of different roles. You know, I was. Did you, know, you do a Geek Squad at all? They had the Geek Squad back in the day? They did. They did. I, I didn't do Geek Squad. Um, I feel like I did like everything except that. You know, I stocked shelves. I did the, the um, what do they call it? I think they so you really it like came from the brick and mortar world. You know, no mm -hmm. joke for you. You have probably, uh, you know, nine years of experience. It's no joke. And uh, a giant retailer uh, that is still around. So it's, it's pretty impressive. And what was the second job? And then in school, I was, I actually worked at the independent Florida Alligator. It was the, um, the what? Independent Florida Alligator. What's that? So it was the school's, um, school's newspaper. newspaper. Yeah. Uh, pretty, pretty well known, very popular for, for a college, uh, newspaper. And I had, you know, we had dedicated sections as account executives to sell different ad space to supplement some of the, the articles. Uh, and then I had, I had the restaurant guide that I had to oversee where, you know, we were covering local businesses, local restaurants, um, you know, dining highlights, their menus, those types of things. 
Um, and that was that was a good experience. Uh, definitely, yeah, it's a great experience. You got brick and mortar and journalism slash advertising. That's 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 and you know dining. That's that's a lethal combination in a few of multiple ways. You you could probably at that point or just open them all and and sell everything <laughs> in that mall. But um, there you go. All right, so 2009. I just want to, for context reason, you know, it's kind of a, you know, it's a major um, financial um, crisis that was, you know, 2008 happened in 2009 was kind of a tough year because financial global crisis, I believe they call it FGS or something like that, financial global crisis, or something. Um, so 2009, you find yourself in a crossroad after college, <clears throat> looking for the next station. What was the dilemmas back then? Yeah, it, it truly was. It was really tricky times to sort of have a lot of certainty as to what the what the next move was and be so, so abrupt. I mean, I, I actually continued working at uh, Best Buy. I was, I, I'd moved away from Gainesville. So the, the uh, paper was uh, no longer, um, no longer any of my work at that time. So ended up moving back home and being with my parents, working at Best Buy. Um, and then, you know, kind of looking at what were solid local immediate options to, to find them. Um, mm -hmm. So my first, uh, my first job out of uh, out of college was as an administration admissions representative for a uh, it was a for profit school it was for Kaiser College which was actually um, Kaiser University which is pretty prominent down here in Florida right um, they specialize in a lot of medical um, uh, different medical kind of uh, education are they familiar uh, are they are affiliated with Kaiser Industries that's like a big corporation for in the healthcare industry I believe right. I don't think so. I, they're they're not affiliated like Kaiser Permanente. They're not affiliated with with them. They're kind of their own. Um, and they they've you know it's a very interesting niche in terms of you know being in Florida, being medical focused, being a for profit college. And there's been a lot of kind of ups and downs. I think um, in that that industry and and for that company. Um, and so that was a little bit out of, out of necessity, needing to find something to kind of you know uh, to jump into something. Yeah, you need a career path. You say, you know, this is, you know, this is the the, the doors that are open for you know for me. So uh, you 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 pull the lever and you get in. And how many years did you stay in with Kaiser? That would have been oh, two thousand and nine until. Yeah, it would have been. Do, 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 do. I want to say it was about three years that I right, was. So ar around two thousand and twelve, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Take us to the next station. What was it? What happened after that? So uh, yeah, was working working there, and then. Um, uh, exploring more, uh, let's say, uh, specialized um, uh, career paths, you know, something that really fit in the vein of what I was doing in advertising. So, um, you know, at that time, my, uh, my then girlfriend, we were, you know, talking about taking things more seriously, we were um, looking at, uh, you know, sort of broadening the scope of areas we'd be willing to, hey, do we need to move to find an opportunity because of the you know, the, the, the landscape, the economic landscape. Mm -hmm. So that's what brought us uh, back actually to the Midwest. Um, I ended up, um, uh, my wife, actually, uh, my now wife, she took a job over the phone that was going to take us back to the, uh, back to the Midwest. Midwest and Wichita area. Once again, the same area. It was actually in uh, Kansas city, mm -hmm. uh, Kansas city. Yeah. Well, the, which side, the Missouri side or the Kansas side? That was, uh, at, on the Missouri side. Got it. Yeah. It's fun to have or something, right? The Kansas city, it's kind of a unique town. It is, it is. Cause it has that melding and there's kind of nuances to, to, to either side, but it's also, you know, kind of a up and coming, you know, um, it's a boom town for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot going on there, uh, for, for the size of the town it is and, and some of the, uh, the arts and the really cool things that they, they do quite well. Um, so that was, that was interesting. They kind of take us. So love back. took you back to the Midwest and to Kansas. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Yep. Got it. Yep. So, um, and we, uh, both, uh, my wife has also studied, um, when she attended UCF here was studying marketing, uh, advertise similar vein. It was kind of the ways in which we, we sparked up some interest. In you said UC, which way, what's your UCS? Uh, UCF. So university of central Florida. Got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. That was really, um, and again, she was working in Kaiser here with a uh, different campus, um, but through training was the way that we kind of synced up. We had mm. the common interest. It was kind of what sparked things from there. Um, yeah. And then that led us back to Kansas City. Um, and I found it, I, I couldn't take a job quickly enough to uh, come on as a, a project coordinator at that time for an advertising agency. Um, this once again, this is 2012. You're in Kansas City, and you're jumping into the world of advertising. This this time with the hardcore advertising mm -hmm. agency. Yep. 
Yep. Uh, what'd you do there? And so my role was um, as a project manager, and they really siloed off the project managers to uh, oversee different um, different creative teams. So the connection, uh, the company was a platform agency, and they did marketing and advertising for for-profit schools. So that was kind of the connection with Kaiser, where there was a little bit of a you know. Uh, uh, the trajectory made somewhat sense where I could say, Hey, I, I was in the trenches. I was doing admissions. You know, we were doing marketing at the ground level. I want to come in now and, you know, be a project manager for, uh, for this agency. So, um, I came in and, you know, we would do traditional advertising. We do collateral, we do that kind of thing. Um, but where I ended up kind of landing was on the video production side of things. Mm. So I would, um, you know, I would do everything on the project management side to define the scope of the project, define the budget of the project. And what kind of, uh, what were the clients? What kind of clients you guys were working for? So, so it would be as if like Kaiser University were, was coming to an ad agency. That would be a platform at the time would do all of their, you know, do all of their advertising, depending on the scope of their contract, of course, uh, but would do some of their advertising. So we've done, like, we've done TV commercials for Kaiser while I was there, uh, ironically enough. Um, and then other, you know, mostly for-profit schools. Um, so the niche of, the, of, your, of, your, uh, of your position was uh, creating these uh, advertising videos for for-profit educational institutions. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Video right. production, whether it was, you know, graphic videos, whether it was, you know, we did some pretty intricate stuff. Like we use, we would use, you know, spots in Kansas City and, you know, do these videos with graphic elements and they, they'd be really built out pretty high production value. Um, so it was really cool to see because, you know, up until that time, the idea of, you know, video production and, you know, thinking through the entire team that you need, whether you need a gaffer or a director of photography, like all of these different production Com team yeah, members. Components, yeah. yeah, it was it was really cool, really cool to be able to see that. And as a project manager, um, a lot of moving pieces. So it's it was um, it was a good way to kind of get deep into that activity. And I think for me, give, give me a lot of confidence as a, as somebody that could. So that first could time you left your, your, your position to a kind of a leadership position in a serious organization, commercial, you know, right. organization, making ads and so forth. So that, that's pretty uh, great experience to, to get there. And how many years did you stay in that role? That was just about, I want to say about two and a half years. So around 2014, 2015. Mm -hmm. R right around there. It might've been, it might've been closer to two years. Cause then we were back um, we were back in Florida, um, by 2014. So about two years. So 2014, you move up to, back to Florida. What was the next station there? So, uh, from, from there, um, sort of reset, um, my wife found a job and then I reset and I, I was looking for opportunities here and, um, kind of, uh, had, had to do a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, um, digging to find good opportunities, uh, at that time. And uh, ended up syncing up with a digital marketing agency that focused on uh, hoteliers, kind of kind of entrenched in the travel industry. Um, sa same and similar role. In this case, it was a, a project manager. Um, the pivot being focusing on digital solutions, so website build outs, doing SEO. Um, the travel industry worldwide, or is more locale of Florida locale? What was kind of the scope? It, it was worldwide. It was really, it was really cool because we'd work with the, you know, Four Seasons, the Hyatt's, these luxury boutique hotels. Um, so you know, every every week or so, you would see these just amazing locations, and then you would figure out, hey, well, how do we make a website that conveys this, and you know, bring in those assets, and make sure that the the, the process was seamless for people to book. Um, for some of those experiences. So that was, that was really cool as well. That's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. 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 So how long ago did you stay in that role? That would have been. Do, 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 do. 214 until. Um, it would have been about a year and a half, mm -hmm. about a year and a half. I was there. Yeah. So about 2015, 2016. That's where you meet your next station. About 2000, uh, about 2015, because this is where it starts to bleed into where Amazon FBA kind of crept in. There we um, go. Yeah. Where, where I was looking still at the time, uh, even more so than back in Kansas city was looking at different side hustles, different ways of, you know, making some extra income. And that's really where, you know, FBA came into the equation. That 2015. Kind of that's when FBA came into to your life. It would have FBA been, I mean, uh, it's just a, for context for selling on Amazon through mm -hmm. uh, FBA, which is the fulfillment by Amazon method. Right. Yep. 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 Okay, so tell you, yeah, let's dive into that. What happened? Who's against who? How did they creep into your life? 
Yeah. So at that time, this was really while I was still at um, Travel Click. Travel Click is the name of the company that I was at um, for um, um, the uh, project management. Um, right. For the hotel industry, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And so I was uh, working with the time uh, with a close, close friend. He and I were working both as project managers, equally, again, looking at, you know, different side hustles and through uh, he and I starting to take very seriously some real estate investing. We found this um, real estate investing community. The head of that community was an affiliate for ASM, Amazing Selling Machine. Um, but at, at, Also known at today time, as Amazing.com. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Got it. And so we, uh, you know, we, we sort of saw this on a whim and it was again, something supplementing the real estate and, uh, it popped up an opportunity where, um, she leading the community, an angel investor was willing to come in, give you, uh, give somebody in the community, some initial seed capital, uh, to buy inventory, to buy into the program, to buy into, uh, ASM. Um, and then they would, they would come in and, and take their, their equity stake in the company. So on a whim, it was over a weekend, I think, where I said, Hey, you know, the, the, the submission process is just say why you would be a good fit. So I just outlined, Hey, okay. So uh, let me get this straight. So, uh, in, in, inside a sense program, there was a, a program inner program that, um, you, uh, apply to, you kind of say, what will, you know, what kind of you know, product you would like to sell? What kind of, you know, what's your vision, what's your dream? And then there's an opportunity for a seed investor or an angel investor to throw capital at you so you can give it a shot. This it's, so it was actually outside of, uh, outside the scope of ASM. Uh -huh. so, so, this, so through ASM, you find other people who are introduced you to this uh, program or opportunity. This is a one-time opportunity or this was happening on a larger scale. Yeah. I mean, so, so the way that it kind of played out is that we found this, the, the way that we found this real estate investing community was actually somebody we knew, kind of a family friend. Um, and he referred us to, hey, check out this thought leader that runs this community. And then we were starting to, to get involved in it. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were a, an affiliate. So they were actually outside of ASM. They were just saying, hey, you know, if this is a program you'd be interested in. Here's a discount commission that they would, they would receive. Right. Um, but then uh, that angel investor was part of their real estate investing community, but all of it, all of it's still separate from ASM. Uh -huh. So you went to ASM, you did the course, you got the training, so to speak. And then you went back to your, uh, you know, your mastermind group with the, with this leader who said, now there's happened to be an angel in the group that you might have a, you know, common ground to, to, to talk about an opportunity. So you basically laid the track, your vision to what you can do. And that's how you guys uh, were matched together. Yeah. Yeah. And it was before. So the angel investor came in and was, giving the capital to be able to take the course to even take ASM. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now I get it. So inside yeah. your mastermind group, uh, you know, um, there was an in initiative to say, go hit that course. I'll, I'll provide the capital because it's not a cheap course, probably a few thousand dollars. Right. Yeah. That yeah. Course. At that time, I think it was like four, four grand. I want to say, right. Was the dynamics was uh, 4,000 dollars. Right. So the dynamic was if you graduate through that course as a continuation or just take the course and you're good to go. What was uh, the expectation there? From uh, expectation from, from, from that angel investor, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, no, it was it was just to to take it and you know a, part of it. this part of the submission to get approved or uh, to sort of win this opportunity was just to say why you would be a good fit, why you would be unique, different. What'd you say? What was your uh, pitch? Um, I, yeah, I think it it was just an opportunity to to humble brag. Um, you know, I I tried to lay out everything I had done up to that point, which was still a pretty corporate path, but like you know, putting myself through college graduating top of my class, like uh, all of these things I was trying to, to really, you know, play myself up to say, Hey, this would be something, something good for me to take on. So, um, well, that's a very cool group too. you're in. Yeah. You're pretty cool uh, group to be in our network. So it's uh, they did you a uh, family, friends who you know, pitch you into the group, did you a uh, great service. Okay. So let's touch the, the ASM part. You took the course, you have the know-how and what was the next move? Yeah, it was a slow start. It was a slow start. So, you know, we, we started to, uh, I started to really take in some of the education and my coworker at the time, um, far more entrepreneurial than I am. He started to kind of see what I was doing. Cause again, the real estate investing kind of was started with, with he and I. And so we were starting to consume more of the content together, which was good, was, was kind of pushing one another, um, and, and really taking it more seriously, but it was pretty slow starting ordering products from China waiting. You know, I didn't have any sense of urgency, I would say in the beginning, um, and you started and it, 2015 or 2000 already rolled into 2016. This would have been, remember. it would have been a late 2014. So a lot of this was still going on while we were both employed at, at, at travel click, Got it. um, at that, at that business. So, mm -hmm. 
um, yeah, we were, you know, we were starting to starting to get going, but slowly, you know, I had again, a lot of products that I was getting in. Right. So you did the market research, you try to identify a lot of products that you can maybe launch in the Amazon marketplace and you source it overseas in China, you get in, you get samples, all that, you know, back and forth, you probably, you register a trademark. No, not at that, not, not in those early stages. Um, I, I eventually, uh, eventually got to that point, but I would say for the first handful of months, it was really slow rolling. I, I just didn't have the sense of urgency. I would say where it was like, okay, let's take our time. We'll order things. We'll wait. But you guys were partner of it, right? A partner in it. You're, you're, you're in, uh, what was the name of your friend? Uh, my, well, his, his name's AJ, AJ Patel. Are you guys still um, around together or? Uh... Yeah, he's now sold brands for, you know, uh, seven, eight figures. He's, he's been quite successful himself. So it, it was a good, good way for us to <laughs> eventually start, uh, at, you know, sort of humble beginnings, uh, let's nice, say. Nice, very cool. Yeah. So it was, okay. but it was good. That really served me. I think, you know, once there, there was kind of a major inflection point and again, it was the same way how it started where it was just kind of a random series of events where, um, I, I want to say it was either ASM or it might've even been the affiliate. They were throwing out, Hey, think about some of these product ideas, you know, these list of 50 product ideas. And, you know, we would, we would take the time to kind of scour those. And we both ended up on a, a beauty product and, uh, both he and I were, essentially brought that same product to market um together separately. or separately? separately 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 so you all had your own infrastructure and you brought uh the same exact product mm -hmm. yeah oh, wow so it shows you the distillery it's, it's very accurate with uh, all the data processing you know put you down into a position where this is where you got to invest in it okay so you both launched around 2015 the same product yeah it would have been uh right at the right at the end of 14 into 15 launching uh both um, both in the same space, similar products. Um, and, you know, we were starting to see, Hey, you know, as, as we were adding in more and more capital, taking things more seriously, adding in more sense of urgency, that there was a sizable return. Um, so it lit a little bit more of a fire, I think underneath us, um, to, to really, you know, get, get things moving. And I think as many negatives as there are to kind of compete at, <laughs> from, from day one, um, there are positives too of like it lit of, you know, that, that competition sort of pushed us. So to, you were competing against him or others when you say mm -hmm. competition, you were competing against each other. Well, more specifically us, but then, you know, we were competing against the others in our space, but I think that competition between us just, just had us pushing a little bit more. Meaning, Oh, I already did this. So you got to catch up. You, you, you already did that. He's trying to catch up. So you go, you guys are fueling each other with your own dynamics to right. put a fire into this um, track that you laid out being entrepreneurs creating your own brand, selling it on Amazon. Uh, that's pretty, pretty cool ride you guys had together. Okay, and we'll take us to the next station or the mess, uh, next major station in, in this path. Yeah, I mean, from there, once once the proof of concept was laid, both as the, the, the strategy, the use of FBA, and then the products that we were bringing to market, it was really kind of growing from that center. It was, you know, how do we develop? You know, we were in the beauty space. And so a lot of, for me, um, it, it was fairly intuitive to think about creating routines and creating a, a more of a not a lifestyle brand because that can feel a little bit cliche but more of the more of the idea of how do i create a line in which a customer will intuitively pick my products next you know if they have a, a regimen that's four or five products you know where they clean their skin they moisturize their skin they utilize a serum they use a shampoo they use you know organic oils how do we sort of take over their their, their bathroom and, and become the go-to brand Mm -hmm. So it made it very easy um, to sort of apply that strategically and then develop and work with our partners to uh, bring those products to market. So, you know, at first it was one, then it was three, then it was five. And then we were consistently adding, you know, new products to the line every two or three months um, and trying to do that as well. You know, and this is where with our vendors, many of them were, were specializing in, uh, in our, it wasn't just part of their you know, wide array of, of catalog. It was, you know, uh, oil specialists. It was, you know, for you using serums. Um, we may have consistently kind of looked at, Hey, how can we, how can we do something a little bit unique or different, uh, in that area? Um, but yeah, it was really just kind of scaling, scaling the line, thinking about a regimen, thinking about a customer's experience with the products and trying to, to own that more okay so uh, this uh, this um trajectory how long did it take place for a few months a few years 
Or yeah, you're would... beefing on your 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 um your portfolio of of, of SKUs or ASINs or you know your your catalog, so to speak. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, would have been uh, it really grew and, and developed up until the time that you know I was ready to have the brand acquired. Um, it was about two and a half, two and a half, three years that did that true ramp up. Like I said, the the beginning was a little bit gray, where you know it was in the holidays of 2014. We were already working full time, like. It, it was a it was a pretty limited side hustle. It was coming into 2015 where it was like, okay, this is this is serious, you know. And there could have been a tie in there too. Those those types of products being in the beauty category. New year, people are thinking, you know, ways of they were natural and organic products. Many people gravitate towards that. You know, they think about their health, their lifestyle, their diet. You know, things they're putting on their skin, their hair. Um, and so I think I think there was an, enough fuel on that fire to really start having it ramp up. And then, yeah, it was just, you know, so for three, three and a half years, like around 2018, you know, you guys um, peaked uh, with the, with this, you know, trajectory of the brand and what happened with next? It was a, uh, an exit. Is, is this an exit story coming in? Yeah. 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 So um, take us there. Was, there was a period of time probably about four months where I was very seriously looking at um, having the brand brand acquired. So was having more of those conversations, scheduling more of those meetings um, and really the party that ended up, uh, acquiring the brand, it was through, uh, through a networking event, just a, um, you know, an event that both myself and my original, you know, colleague now business owner, who's running his own brands, um, both of us attended were big parts of, and, um, yeah, it was, it was great. Cause I, you know, I, that time you're hearing a lot of different numbers, you're meeting with a lot of people, uh, and as you're trying to run your business and try to maintain that focus, it's, um, it's, a, it's a lot to kind of juggle, um, to, to, uh, have all that going on at once. But so, um, so the moment the opportunity presented itself that you're able to sell your brand uh, until you sold it, how long did it take? Would you say how, how long, like the, uh, you realize, of- Oh, there's, there's a market, there's buyers who buy actually these Amazon brands or Amazon businesses like I just developed for the past few years. So mm-hmm. there's the moment you realize it and, to, and then you take action, you meet your network, whatever it is, until you actually sold the business. How long did that take? Um, it was, yeah, I mean, it was serious, taking it seriously in terms of the acquisition. It was about four solid months, if not six months, where I had more of that mental shift. Um, and then, yeah, when I lined up with the right party, you know, we were, we were measuring things sort of in two, three month chunks. Uh, the due diligence was relatively quick as well. And then my transition off the, the brand was, you know, that was about 30 days too. Um, so it was a pretty tight timeline based on some of the yeah, things it that sounds they pretty quick to. by all mm-hmm. means. And, um, uh, if, if it's okay to ask, what was the multiple that they bought the business for in the multiple, usually just to, to, to give some context to the audience, when you're trying to sell, um, your business, uh, at least in the Amazon space, they kind of look at your earnings, what's your earnings before you call it EBITDA earnings before interest tax and amortization. And then they give a multiplier. I'm going to give it, pay you three times your earning four times, five times, whatever it is. Basically, their future earnings, uh, instead of you staying in the business for years, uh, making the money or not making it, they're buying it off your hands and ins- ensuring that you make that money. Uh, so in your case, what was the multiple there? It was it was about 4.3. 4.3? Mm-hmm. Got it. Okay. Pretty good. Pretty decent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I was I was happy with it. And at that point in time with the business, um, I, I was ready to transition. I had, I had, you had a team or was it all you? Uh, I had a team. I had a team. How large was the team? When you it sold was it? at the time that the the brand was acquired. Um, I think it was, was still relatively small. It was about six uh, six people on it. Did most of them stay? All of them stay? None of none of them stayed after the the purchase. I think one or two of them uh, moved on, uh, but then they had their own team members that they were kind of coming in and right. Yeah, and it makes sense. On. Yeah. Right, so two left and about three or four stayed. Yes. Yeah. Got it. I know of at least three that did stay. Yeah. Okay, very good. All right, so what was the next session for you? 2018, you're unemployed, but you made an exit. So congratulations on that. Uh, what uh, what transpired after, after yeah, that? It's all, it's all rosy from there. No, it, it was actually <laughs> a really, really hard time uh, for me. Um, really? Why is yeah, that? I, 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 had a, I had a, I think, really, I had a lot of mental struggles with the idea of um, doing this thing and having this this baby of sorts of your business for so long and identifying with it that once it was outside Gone. of my control and right. my day-to-day completely changed, um, yeah, it was like a, it, it was um, an interesting time. It was really tough. And, and like I said, when you think 
oh, okay, you go through that and you're, you're supposed to be the happiest. You're like, you know, from, from anybody viewing what's going on and myself included, you're, you have your payday, you're, you, you can con- consider retiring, stepping away, taking some time. But um, yeah, I really struggled with it. And, and I've talked with a lot of, a lot of sellers, a lot of people have gone through business acquisitions and I feel like it's sort of one of the unspoken things. Um, more often I know the not. answer to this. I'll give you the answer in a moment if you need it. But yeah, it's one yeah. of those. Yeah, well, what's your take on this? I, I, I think it's identity. I think it's at the core of who you are when you are just doing something and you're so ingrained into it. You're mis- you know, emotionally and physically invested in it. And then, and again, for me, it was a, a very, a relatively quick transition. So you have, you have all of this deep, deep, deep commitment and then a massive drop off. Um, I think, that, I think for myself, my own uh, kind of analysis of it is that, that it, it was really tied to that. Um, and I thought I was going through health issues and you know, <laughs> it, it was, it yeah, was, it was yeah, it's, it's psychosomatic. So the mental brain it has some, so this vacuum that comes in and there's a the void that you have, needs to be filled and it's not. So on the body level, you know, there's pains, there's aches, there's illnesses. So yes, yeah, it's, it's a very powerful uh, struggle to play internally with the, with the mind and the body of the people. But mm-hmm. I, I think from my perspective, it's the, what I call the entrepreneurial bug that's in people. If you're a true entrepreneur, you have that all of a sudden that dive, that cliff that nothing's there yet afterwards. And that bug just wants to be attached to another body and, you know, wants to, wants to, you know, be a part of it. So I guess that led you to the next tracks that you laid to having seller tools, which you're one of the co-founders and CEO. So was that what transpired after that, after that, you know, that slope where, you know, your entrepreneurial bug is itching you, it's itching you, you have to do something about it. And it created another business that you created. Yeah. I mean, actually, so after, after the uh, business was acquired, there was kind of going through that experience. And then for how long, how long did it last? Would you say that experience, that transition mode, you know, it would have been a few weeks, a few months. No, it was that. Yeah. It was a handful of months. It was probably about five, six months mm-hmm. um, where, where it was, a, it was a lot of, and this is know, already rates. 2018 already gliding into 2019. But th- so this is actually cause the, the brand was acquired 2017, uh, February, 2017. And mm-hmm. so, and then I transitioned off effectively Mar- March, April. And so it was really that part of the year where, um, of 2017. I, I, yeah. You're kind of, kind of struggling, uh, you know, you're with yourself and around 2018, what happened then? And then, and then through, uh, through my network, I was able to connect with a few brand owners that were kind of going through similar experiences. They were in the midst of, of going through their own acquisition. We're trying to set in more systems, more processes, looking at Amazon strategies, uh, which dovetailed really nice with my skill set in terms of, you know, a project manager, you know, operational excellence. That's a lot of stuff I like to kind of geek out on. Um, and so I, I, I came in, started consulting for them mm. to uh, build out their team, build out their processes, um, think about some of their Amazon strategy and make sure that it was scalable um, as, they, as they were going through that. So they were in the midst of their own transition. And how did it feel? Was, how did it feel that the opportunity to help, to help from your knowledge, from your skill, from your, your, from your force? That, was that a healing process for you? That, it was. It was. I mean, I think, yeah, to your point, it, it, it's, it, uh, it solved a lot of the, uh, the gray, I would say, in terms of you know, not having something else to... Um, I don't just, want to say derive meaning, but like when you, when you really take your work that seriously, it's yeah. When you're an entrepreneur, you're full of energy, you're full of a lot, full of talent. It needs to explode somewhere. It needs an outlet. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't, it's, uh, it's painful. Right? So once you find that outlet again, it's a healing process where, Oh, all my might, all my talent, all my skill. It just, uh, it just cause it's a beautiful synergy. It's a beautiful symphony of, of, of action and doing on a daily basis, which humans simply need. We're just built like that. Right. Yep. And that was great. I mean, that was a that was a learning opportunity in of itself in terms of consulting, um, because I am I am somebody that doesn't mind getting my hands dirty, and I had to kind of learn. I had to learn that sweet spot of like not implementing but advising, so that way that my full value could be um, could kind of be utilized in that capacity. Um, but that was great. That was a great opportunity to to sort of just distill my knowledge, convey it. Sometimes get in there and and, and get my hands dirty, but but really lend to. to value for some of those brands. That's um, great. That's great. That's a really yeah. nice uh, healing story there. Okay. So what was the next station? So from there, um, similar, uh, similar kind of, uh, occurrence where through an event, um, through, through this same kind of group network that I have, 
Um, and this is a real estate group or how many groups are involved in it? seems like you're like, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you're pretty spread out nice into all these groups. <laughs> we, sh we should exchange group lists uh, later. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, I think a mastermind. It might've been, um, one of the big events, uh, that's been really big for me is, is, uh, is Ryan Moran's community. He's been, he's been really great in bringing a lot Capitalism of capitalism.com, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if anybody's not familiar, capitalism.com, Ryan Moran, very uh, robust, uh, you know, uh, group, and you know, he, led by him, uh, really focused on entrepreneurship, making money, opportunities, identifying opportunities, working, hustling. Uh, so, if anybody wants to tap into that, um, that's what you did. So, what what happened with that? Yeah, it it was a event where I, we were having really great conversations for you know what's next, what people are working on, how can we collaborate, and this is really where uh, the opportunity with Solar Tools presented itself. Uh, where I connected with uh, my now two two partners, um, and got some of the things that they were working on, and you know, Solar Tools at that point in time was really um, one of my business partners, Brendan Morris. It was really just an internal set of tools he was using for his brands. Uh, his brands doing exceptional scale. I mean, he's consistently been running seven eight figure brands, um, and that was really the starting place. Was tools that only he was using, that only he needed at that scale of business. Um, and okay, so let, 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 let's uh, let's take a moment here. So, what's the name of your partner again? You have two partners in with Tillow Tools today, right? Mm -hmm. what's yeah. The, fir the, the first guy is so Brendan Brendan Morris. Brandon Morris. Uh, Brendan. Brendan with the knee. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, and then uh, the second gentleman is. And then uh, the second one is Todd A. Pearson. Todd A. Pearson. Mm -hmm. Okay, and how'd you guys all meet through the Capitalism.com network? Yeah. Yep. Got you to join forces, uh, Brendan had its, you know, kind of suite of tools that he was he developed internally to use for his, uh, for his brands that he's, he's, that, uh, that he's pushing and he's doing at a high level, seven, eight figures. And that created some sort of a roll up into its own solution. Yeah. Yeah. And he was looking for more steady, uh, reliable, uh, higher level developers at that time because he was able to kind of just bootstrap what he was developing at that point. And that's where for the three of us, we saw a lot of this obvious synergy where, you know, whether it was highly technical, whether it was our background, all as sellers, excuse me. And then, you know, for myself coming in, it was, okay, how do we make this more, more broadly available? And with my skill set in terms of building more operations, doing, do, being willing to do business de development, those types of things, um, was just seeing a synergy across the three of us. Um, Interesting. And, so, yeah, and this is 2019. That's when you kind of started rolling up seller tools as seller tools. You know, you branded it, packaged it, and went out to the world. It was 2019 or it was already 2020? That would have been uh, 18. 18, Two. where we're, we're really starting to uh, welcome some of the initial users. We're, you know, building out packages and plan to different, you know, different feature levels. Um, and yeah, that's that's really where the core uh, core suite now with a little bit higher touch, again, on the development side. Um, more unique feature set, more, you know, elegant data aggregation, all these things that we were doing with, you know, at that point in time with search volume, um, utilizing more of that data. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really where I would say the foundation was sort of set. Yeah, proof uh, of concept, early roll up 2018, but in 2019, you guys are already much more formidable. You are out there strong into the market, but, you know, talk about seller tools. What's like the main thing? What, what is the main value? What is the main solution? Or because you know, it's a package of tools, so it touched maybe it's just in a few of them or the core ones. You know, if I'm an I'm an if I am an Amazon seller listening to this, tell me who are you? What, what's going on with this? What are you providing me? Yeah, no, I, the way that I like to kind of describe because we are an all-in-one suite is that we have that uh, optimization foundation that covers keyword research, keyword tracking, listing optimization. We have alerts, we have competitive analysis. So there's a robust foundation set of features. Um, where we sort of innovate and where a lot of people will, will also come in the door for this reason is the things that we do with mini chat and our API. Um, and I think rightfully so. And when you're talking about how these uh, tools uh, allow you to rank more easily, getting page one visibility and capture more Amazon reviews. Um, and we know if we consistently do that, we'll always have a, a very a wide user base. So at the heart um, of it, the suite of tools helps you to optimize kind of everything that you're touching in order to generate sales, which is your PPC campaigns, advertising, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, the rank of your listing, uh, the conversion rate uh, of your listing, all these components that make you strong in the marketplace. So the set of tools is really supposed to, on each level, it's each unique uh, nuance, uh, empower you and help you blow it up. 
right, so to speak. But also there's an interesting component of utilizing many chat, a flow in many chats where you can actually capture audience outside of Amazon. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if I'm wrong at any point, just feel free to, you know, correct me. Or, or <laughs> you sound great. <laughs> yeah. So you capture and interact with consumers outside the Amazon ecosystem, you know, mm -hmm. through, through many chats, creating all these flows. So if there's a consumer, show, you know, going on Facebook or some of this website, you know, they see maybe a picture of a product or a video of a product, they're interested in it, they click in it, you capture them, you engage with them. So you have a relationship with them, so to speak. And it's all managed automatically through a very uh, a well thought of uh, flow. And the, these consumers, they, they, they seem to like it. So they get maybe an offer and the offer might say, you know what, this product is 19.99. It's, it's a, let's say a cutting board top of the line, whatever, it's all good. If you'd like to actually try it out, you know, you can, here's a flow. Here's how you can really um, find it or buy it. You can buy it on our website or maybe even buy it on Amazon. Or let's say you choose Amazon, you buy it on Amazon, you pay $19.99. Thank you very much. And then we'll send you a follow-up, you know, how'd you like it? How was it? Here, also, also we offer you a rebate. Okay, basically saying, you know, here's $19.99 or maybe $9.99, whatever, it can be a full cover of, of the, the product or some of it to indulge them and say, you know, uh, thank you for trying. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you for engaging with us and the whole thing. And by doing that, if you're throwing, uh, throwing traffic, healthy traffic into your listings uh, online uh, on your own website or even Amazon, uh, these listings that come in and they actually convert and, you know, there's a purchase being made and your, uh, your matrix to improve with Amazon's eyes and especially Amazon loves, loves, loves outside traffic that converts. They're in love with that because that's how they feel that their ecosystem is simply growing and growing, which is correct, by the way. That's mm -hmm. a very powerful thing Amazon has behind the scenes. Um, they, even though they're a giant, they always have a passion to how do we get more uh, insensible uh, appetite. So in this ecosystem, sell, you know, tools can help the sellers uh, engage more and optimize more and just get more bang for the buck from all fronts. Is that kind of a fair analysis of uh yeah, yeah. Uh, no, you, you went you went in deep, and, and there's there's a lot of uh, other things I, I would say you can do with it as well. It's really customizable. Um, but as you touched on, I mean, it, how it checks off all these boxes, and there can be the perception of complexity. So this is where, like for us, we we give our mini chat flows away for free. So we want you know whether it's new sellers, legitimized brands that are getting into um, the use of mini chat uh, as an as as an Amazon seller. Um, we wanted to make sure that these specific strategies, you had a flow in hand. It's just ready, ready to go. Plug in your. So, so you guys, even though there is a level of complexity of this, this is an art. You make it turnkey by saying, you know, this kind of the menu. There's a menu if you're, you know, if you're beginning, your entry level. This is probably what's going to suit you the most. So it is customized, but you're ready from very, very well, you know, well-crafted experience. So to make a decision, eventually it's really easy. It's like when you go to a new restaurant, they say, there's all this massive, massive menu, but look, there's a lunch special, dinner special, Italian special, Chinese special. All right. I feel like Chinese, so boom, let me have that. <laughs> is that kind of the, the dynamic? I like that idea. Yeah. I'm going to have to start using that now. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You got it. No worries. Uh, all right. Very cool. So, uh, you know, this is where you guys are now and looking into the future. What, where would you like, you know, you guys want to be at? What, what's your challenges that, that are stopping you from getting there? What, what's, yeah. the, what's the status for, you know, or dynamics for you right now in the marketplace? Yeah, I, I think the way that you described Solo Tools 2 initially as a, as a growth platform uh, is, is really where our vision lies. Um, because I think now sellers have no shortage. There's no secret. There's no shortage of Amazon software tools. Um, where we want to be is on the growth side of things. The maintenance uh, is where you lend your, yourself and your brand to potentially stagnating and, and for smaller sellers turning out of this business mm -hmm. uh, and for bigger sellers just missing their potential. So we want to continue to build a feature set that is focused on growth, focused on the 80-20 of Amazon, which is ranking and reviews as we've, as we've touched on. And if we continue to innovate there, um, we want to keep growing. We want to 2X, 3X our business as we've done this past year. 2020 has been, been great for us. I know it has been for many e-commerce brands, but that's our... That's our unique space in the market is, is truly focusing on growth. If we can automate those high value activities, that's where brands can play a different game than everyone else. They have the leverage of, of Amazon. And then these have these tools that are all about just, you know, putting fuel on that fire. Um, and we want to be a key part of that. So that's really where our current features, I think, do an exceptional job of it. But as we look ahead to uh, this next year, it's doubling down, going even deeper, um, yeah, and bringing something truly unique where, where sellers absolutely need us, right? That's that's what, what our goal is, is having that real stickiness to where we're essential to growth on Amazon. Yeah, you want to be part of that DNA, the growth DNA for, for all the marketplace sellers. So now, you know, uh, sharing your struggles in the past today, um, 
you find this is your passion. This is uh, where you're committed to. This is where you see your own growth. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been really great. I mean, going from seller to consultant to now on the SaaS side, it's been very eye-opening. Uh, you sort of see what you like and don't like. Um, there's, there's you know, never any, I would say, perfect path. Um, one of the things I, we see with SaaS, and you know, um, I think this is not unique to us, is things just taking twice as long to build and twice the cost. Like, it's just, it can be very intensive. And I think sometimes people see, oh, you know, it'd be so easy to just do this or like, oh, can't you add that? And we are, we are a team of no shortage of ideas. Um, again, as sellers ourselves, our wish list is a, a mile long. It, it okay. really is. Um, and so that's, that's our task is really kind of distilling um, the absolute essential um, and making sure that it ties into our, ties into our vision. So, and that's fun. Those are fun challenges. So that's where yeah, I you're a great spot. This is a great place yeah. to be where you're saying, you know, I'm growing so fast, but how can I grow even more? And that's kind of where my, I put my energy and focus on. Uh, and that's a pain, you know, growing pains is a great pain to have. And I do wish that for any entrepreneur out there listening. Um, okay. So let's do a quick recap of your situation and then we'll close off the episode. Um, right. So graduate 2009, you dabble into uh, working with, um, uh, uh, admissions, right. For, for university, you do mm -hmm. in Florida, you bounce back to the Midwest, you do about two years, you, you, you do a uh, marketing for, uh, and, and video editing for kind of the same industry for, for, uh, uh, you know, for profit education. Uh, then you bounce back to uh, Florida and you focus more on uh, advertising for the travel industry. Uh, so you spend a few, a few years in that space as well. And then through some family friends, you, uh, you kind of dabble into real estate, which led you to dabble into uh, e-commerce uh, and selling on Amazon, hence developing your own brand, doing it for about three years, growing it to a very nice dimension where you, ha you have a liquidity event, you made an exit. Then you find yourself actually, instead of being, you know, uh, elevated or elated, uh, it created a kind of a discord because your entrepreneurial bug was, um, was uh, you know, eating you from the inside and you needed an outlet uh, to, to pour all your uh, might and talent and skill and passion into, uh, which made its way into a, at the early beginning to consulting, right? Because you, you can easily share your skills and knowledge to, uh, you know, certain players. And then um, once again, through family networks, you're able to connect uh, with my, Ryan Moran, not family networks, for, uh, you know, networks that you're involved with. In this case, Ryan Moran, you meet your current partners where you guys create an, an innovative suite of tools uh, that uh, hyper-focus on, helping, you know, sellers grow uh, and, you, uh, and and focus on growth. So this has been going on for the past two plus years. You're tripling, you know, double tripling almost every year. Uh, that's kind of the, the, the quick snapshot of uh, your, your position. That sounds, that sounds about right. Yep. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right. It's very cool. So, up. <laughs> so now we're going to touch two last points uh, to, wrap, uh, to wrap it up. So the first thing will be if anybody wants to learn more and, you know, connect with you and follow you, where can they find you? And the last thing will be is what is your message of hope and inspiration for entrepreneurs listening out there? Yeah. Uh, so where you can find us, uh, we're at seller.tools. You can always reach out to us at hello at seller.tools. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. We've got a 14 day free trial so you can try out anything that you see from us, whether it is many chat optimization, PPC, uh, we've got you covered. And then we've got a great Facebook group, uh, FBA Kings, a great place to uh, have really great. And for the most part, very elevated, uh, high caliber sellers and brands in that community as well. So um, that's where you can, you can find us. Um, and I would say kind of as a parting inspirational message, I share this on another podcast. And so I've had, I've had a little bit more time to think, think mm -hmm. about it too. And I think it lands really well is, uh, is really the idea that, you know, nobody has, even the, the most inspirational people that you see or business leaders or entrepreneurs, you know, nobody has the answers. They're still failing to this day. Um, and I think sometimes we, we see these people and we think that's so out of reach, whether it's uh, their achievements um, or their monetary success, you know, whatever, whatever label you put on it. Um, and I think really acknowledging that is uh, very eye opening because it gives you more of the freedom to yes, take chances, uh, to be willing to fail. Uh, one of the things I always say too, is many of the successful people I know in my network, it's sort of like, um, I view it in my mind as like this graph where they have, you know, they have equal number of failures as they do successes. And as people get more and more successful, they have more and more failures. Um, and yeah, it's true. The most, the most successful people I know have had literally the most quantifiable failures. So giving yourself that permission, um, can give you a little bit more peace of mind, let you take some chances and, and, and dream and think big. Got it. I like it. So the, it permits yourself to fail because as you permit yourself to fail more, you attempt to fail more. Uh, it's, it's just on the other side, it's like a balance sheet. It's going to create a, a success along the way. So it's mm -hmm. always kind of balanced. So the more you try, 
uh, and you fail, hopefully on the other end, uh, you'll, you'll touch successes and that's kind of the balance on things and any scope and any level. Uh, if you have, if you ask Jeff Bezos on his failure list, it's probably long as much as he does success list. And if you, you know, brought him to the highest multitude, uh, in terms of, I guess, economical, uh, or monetary, uh, levels that we in the world, uh, definitely recognize. All right, Troy, enjoyed it. Thank you so much for sharing. It was very kind of you. We wish you guys and the whole team much more, uh, you know, tremendous and continued success along the years. Keep pumping others. That's really a good focus to have. Thank you, everybody, for uh, listening and joining with us today. Until next time. Thanks.